Hi all, I have one of the most spectacularly smooth stockfish wins that I've seen in TSEC recent history. This is TSEC season 19, Komodo against Stockfish NN. Let's have a look at this game. So D4, we have a Dutch defense, and actually we have the Leningrad Dutch. So it's characterized by black early Fianchettoing here. So both sides of Fianchetto. And we have knight h3, which is a bit of a fancy move, but it does mean that the bishop's diagonal is not distracted, and sometimes knight f4 and d5 is useful. Black castles, white castles, d6, and we have d5. Now, one of the ideas I felt with d5 in general, this is part of the opening book, is anytime black plays e5, I think the idea, especially with the knight h3, is, is to take on e6, to liberate the bishop, and maybe put some pressure on d6, later if black ever plays c6 i thought that was a key idea slight downside you know the c5 square is weakened and black uses that knight c3 knight c5 and this is the end of the book we have bishop e3 and now black does dare to play stockfish does dare to play e5 and this is my first major question about the game most over the board players when checking this position out they play d takes e6 it is the most critical move it seems uh, so for example if c6 uh, bishop takes c5 is not not good but I just want to show you it first because black I think only gets um, you know a small disadvantage that's not bad because you know black has the counterpart uh, has the bishop rather without the counterpart the dark squares are going to be good and you know d5 is under control these double pawns may, might not be as bad as all that however if white doesn't take on c5 and probes instead it seems as though white should be getting a more significant advantage here with play against this backward pawn so this for me is is starting to be evidence that actually the over the over the board crowd have got it right here you know d takes e6 seems to be a natural thing to play and you know stockfish 12 also seems to think itself you know this this is the way to play uh there, there has been an over the ball game knight takes e6 knight f4 c6 knight takes bishop takes where you know white was doing well as in l hansen against nilsson white went on to win in 1997 key stem game uh and yeah on bishop takes e6 uh, there's b4 as an example here and this position seems as though white's getting something as soon as black plays the move c6 which sometimes becomes kind of an imperative because of this pin the d5 square the pressure against b7 uh, then we have this backward pawn situation and it does seem for example here b5 is going to be a uh, good that's going to be good for white and if black goes defensive with rook c8 then queen a4 and it, it just seems like this is a good situation for white to be in so it's kind of strange to me what happens here actually after e5 this ensemble wasn't used uh has komodo komodo forgot about ensemble it played actually b4 and this seems to leave in my view a kind of accelerated king's engine defense style position where you know white has a slightly worse version than normal we see okay technically white might have a small edge but black's position is already quite easy to play so we have queen b3 h6 rook 81 queen e7 bishop d2 knight b8 and we have f3 knight bd7 we have rook c1 okay so if it was a king's engine uh the things that you'd be looking out for here are things like c5 undermining the pawn chain at the exploitable base like d6 trying to get into c7 sometimes trying to get rid of this light square bishop so the attack doesn't mean anything that kind of thing happens in the king's engine but here it seems a different story has emerged there after a5 it's a slightly different story we have a3 clearly if b5 well not clearly I'll, I'll i'll show you this outpost is going to be great for black and white uh, doesn't even have the luxury of e4 like in the king's engine or the occupation which is usually a good thing but here it's definitely it seems about equal so a3 is played and we have king h8 
knight f2 and now g5 this seems very natural easy to play stuff so knight b5 knight e8 protecting c7 e4 now and the knight is kicked back knight c3 uh, we have f4 and now g4 now for me this looks like a ready-made plan for black is later to play for h5 with due preparation we have c5 trying to close up the queen side and with this it seems black's kind of solid on the queen side able to withstand uh, any major structural damage because there's no major structural damage about to occur sometimes when you play the king's engine defense it's like your queen side is going to disappear you kind of take that for granted and here it doesn't seem to be the case so we have actually king g7 which makes way for the rook to use the h file here like a4 b6 so black is having a solid fortress over this side at the moment queen c2 now rook h8 b takes b takes rook b5 we have now the queen dropping back the rooks double bishop e7 the rook goes to b2 on on five to b2 the knight comes to f6 which seems to support h5 queen c3 queen e8 knight b6 that's taken rook takes queen f8 knight d3 knight d7 hitting the rook and the rook installs itself on c6 it seems komodo is interested in a tactical shot at some point because you can tell this because all parts of the pawn chain are being touched upon here by white uh, the knight the rook the rook seems a little bit stranded though it's an interesting installation and the king is probably missing these guys you know this this could be a king safety issue this rook on c6 uh, so that's pretty interesting uh, situation to be in so we have here king g8 and now queen b2 and it looks as though there's a battery about to be set up against this pawn chain again so even more uh, damage could be done rook h7 bishop c3 so a battery is set up the pawn chain is being uh, it seems about to be blown blown away but in the midst of this we have a4 this is a pretty interesting move actually getting the pawn away from that bishop sometimes there's a resource which might creep in like this using the a5 square sometimes uh, so we have queen b5 bishop d8 bishop f1 rook f7 king g2 queen e7 it seems this is a small quiet before the storm period here so queen f8 bishop d1 quite before the storm rook h2 and we have rook b2 and here black dan did not dare to play h5 it seems stockfish and then has learned from leela to do a bit of shuffling to test things run some tests on the opponent uh, to see if they have a less than optimal configuration so we have this kind of waiting move rook f7 rook a2 and this rook a2 actually seems a, t a small inaccuracy by all accounts however rook b1 is also it seems from my limited analysis it seems as though black could be enabled for an attack even with rook b1 this is just a variation for example rook h7 h5 knight f6 so at one pawn sack white blast the pawn chain it seems black ends up maybe with an advantage here in the variations I checked uh, for example like this black ends up with an advantage it seems and in the king h1 variations uh, so let's say uh, instead of rook a2 rook b1 uh, there's also you know uh, if h5 here black also might be doing okay in this line as well it shows that black's position you know has got some attacking potential there's a potential even to use the a5 square as mentioned and black should end up with a small edge it seems on my analysis uh so yeah it's interesting this rook a2 uh move and so we've just checked out briefly rook b1 and by the way on rook h7 king h1 as an alternative 
It seems a double pawn sack is an interesting recipe here for the attacking player to think about. Uh, here with f3, the double pawn sack seems to give a lot of pressure on g4 and e4 here, which is difficult for white to parry. If white has to do an exchange sack of some sort, then knight takes d5, hits that bishop, and this ends up being okay for black as well with, with an advantage. So it seems on my you know limited analysis that rook a2 maybe some small inaccuracy in some way but um stockfish doesn't toy around anymore it plays actually h5 and now g takes h5 is played and you might think wow isn't this fragmentational just double pawns there and this pawn's kind of weak and it's also liberated the g pawn in fact it's given multiple trump cards all in one shot hasn't it uh, so, but the thing is, if h3, there is violence behind the scenes here. If h3 had been played, it seems as though hg, hg, rook h7, and actually with knight f6 and bishop takes g4, this is an interesting recipe with queen h6. We can see here that the y of white's play has been questioned. If it was it just to win a pawn on the queen side, because the king has been abandoned, the y doesn't seem to be that compelling. If there's a king safety issue here, it seems the installed installed rook on c6 is a spectator piece entrenched in the opponent's position here, and not able to help the king. For example, knight f2. Can you see what black could do here in this variation? If I give you five seconds, what would you do to uh, proceed here? In fact, two moves will do. Hundred points for either. In this situation, you know, black has not burnt too many bridges on the queen side and can actually either play knight takes e4 with a crushing attack or even queen h2, you know, with a crushing attack. Still making use of knight takes e4 though. And this is just, you know, a crushing attack essentially. So it does seem as though the, the move h3 is actually out of the question. So g takes h5. We have. Um, Knight f6 now, and now white goes for it. This pawn chain attack, bishop takes e5. Uh, if white does nothing, say queen b2, then knight takes h5 and bishop d7. For example, g4 comes along and it's pretty strong for black here. For example, mating on f1 in this pretty line. So let's have a look. So bishop takes e5 was tried, but it is a peace sack. And now, okay, a lot of pawns, but the pawns do need a bit of time to queen. And the other problem with pawns, even though numerically you can add them on the scale like three pawns for a piece, there is this thing called blockade, which nullifies pawns. And Nimzovich was a big fan of blockade, especially in related to pawns. And it does nullify sometimes a, a quantity of pawns. You know, for example, a dark square bishop can sometimes blockade a whole load of light square pawns. Uh, by itself sometimes is this going to be one of those scenarios now after knight d7 white plays rook takes c8 if knight takes here bishop takes this situation is also losing material for white because of bishop h3 check and that discovery against b7 so it doesn't actually matter here white is going to be losing the exchange anyway uh, if rook b7 is not played you know as an, an idea rook then Rook b1, bishop d4 is going to force the rook onto c7 here and win the exchange like that. So that's going to be better. Uh, okay, so anyway, so let's go back. So white just gave up the exchange here basically and is essentially <laughs> a rook down for a few pawns. This isn't entirely great news. Bishop takes a4, rook h7. Bishop e8 trying to cling on to the h5 pawn. If instead, you know, trying to cling on to c4 instead, then the thing is, king f7, for example, e5, rook takes. And we can see here that that feature of light square pawns, you know, or blockade is going to be invoked as soon as, you know, d6, then maybe e6, what e6, there's a dark square blockade, there's blockade potential essentially in this position for the extra pawns, you know, trying to compensate for the rook. They don't really compensate for the rook. So we have bishop e8. So white's essentially a rook down for a few pawns. 
and we have rook takes c4, bishop g6, and the other rook joins force, king h3. And it looks as though, well, at least the king's safe, right? Not true, actually. After rook g1, horrible things are afoot here. Bishop f5, rook c3 actually threatens with that pin uh, to play... Uh, Threatening rook takes f3, not not just pinning the pawn. Threatening to take it, rook takes f3 checkmate. So we have bishop g4, but the pawn is pinned. Uh, and now we have bishop c7, which keeps the rook out of b8 for the moment. And we see this blockade feature of light square pawns for a moment. Rook goes to d2. We have rook e1. And now d6 is, is kind of permitted. The bishop sits comfortably on d8 here. Just blockading like that. White maybe is trying to tokenly lift the blockade, but is there time after rook d3? There isn't because now the pawn's hit. We have d7 trying to cling on. King f7, and the king can come to e7 here. It seems as though white's pawns are just not quick enough in this position. a4 is tried, rook h1. And the problem is here, there's a new problem emerging which is essentially this pawn being pinned. So the power of the pin piece is illusionary. G3 is an illusion. And it means actually black, if given a few moves, plays rook d1, rook g1, and rook g3, and that will be checkmate. If we were to reverse engineer this as humans, if we want to try the same sort of thing. Uh, so e5, rook d, d1, and rook d, g1 now threatens rook g3 mating. So we have rook g2, and with this, you know, King G7. Uh, the pawns are not really going anywhere still. And now King H6, E6. We have this situation where the pawns are being shaken out. The exchange has been prompted by White. It's coming to a Zugzwang scenario here. It seems. Uh, so, you know, White decided it's best to take there. We have a take. Bishop f5, king h6, the bishop goes back, and now this pawn's rounded off. And yeah, it's just a rook down, essentially. It's essentially a whole rook down. These pawns are pretty blockaded, nullified by the blockade. Okay, this is pushed now, but it's going to be weak. It's going to be picked up. It is picked up. And yeah, it looks like a totally smooth engine game. 83 moves here, white's resigned. So what essentially happened is there's a key point in this game, in my view, where the over the board world is shouting for D takes E6. This is the whole idea behind Knight H3 sometimes to play Knight F4. Once you have D takes E6, you have, a, you know, at least, you know, a, a downside to play on the backward D pawn. Because usually this Bishop on the Fianchetto means Black wants to shield with C6, gets a backward pawn. But that never happened in the opening. It seems as though Black, by White playing... A different move. Black seems to get a souped up version of the King's Engine Defense, an accelerated version where the, the Queen side wasn't an immediate melt meltdown. And H5 was actually super dangerous behind the scenes with ideas of peace sacrifices on G4. And yeah, white fragmented, then tried to blast the pawn chain, essentially was a rook down for a few pawns, and it was pretty smooth impression given by this game so i thought one of the smoothest wins actually i've seen uh from stockfish the new stockfish nn pretty smooth win in my view one of the smoothest in recent tzet history what do you guys think okay by the way i've got a new course at udemy king's crusher tv slash opening tango which is all about uh the tango systems so nimza which of e5 which tony moles had great results with and uh, the Mexican defense, they're all uh, weakness provocation systems. And I, I do mention a lot about the philosophies of weakness provocation. You might want to check that out. The bit.ly slash leader chess playlist, bit.ly slash stockfish chess playlist, King's Crusher TV slash discord. And also, if you want to challenge me for a game, bit.ly slash chess world, just register there and I'll be able to invite you for a game soon after five days move. Okay, comments, questions, like, share, subscribe with the notification bell. Always appreciated. Help feed the YouTube neural network algorithms. Thanks very much. Cheers then.